All right, here we are back for part two. So we talked about these antibodies produced by B cells, and because antibodies are proteins, I can do protein chemistry on them. And so I think it's pretty amazing that you have these antibodies that are made of 20 amino acids, a little bit of glycosylation on them, but honestly, it doesn't really usually affect how they work too much. And so these are proteins that we can make in a lab. We can grow them up just like what you grew up for uh, 4362 when you make proteins that way. And so remember that the antibody is an immunoprotein, and I am using the word designed by the immune system to bind an antigen. It's designed through evolution. So the antigen is can be big or small. Antigen can be a little tattoo ink molecule. It can be a protein, and it can be a protein that's by itself or a protein in the context of a whole cell. But because an antibody is a protein itself, let's show a protein antigen. And the thing is, the antibody has a shape that matches the antigen. How does it do this? We have a little bit of the discussion of that coming up. So, and oh, and by the way, this antigen, I believe, is lysozyme. It's hen egg white lysozyme, which is one of the classic proteins of protein chemistry. This is a protein chemistry interaction that we can take apart with all the tools that you've learned through biochemistry. So the first thing we want to do is we get a bunch of antibodies, we run them on gels, we figure out what the chains are, and we quickly find out antibodies are pretty big. They're about 180, 150 kilodaltons big. And they're made up of many different domains, and they're actually made up of four chains. If you run an antibody on a non-reducing gel, you get 150 kilodaltons. If you run it on a reducing gel, all of a sudden you get two bigger pieces and two smaller pieces. I don't want to say what the numbers are because I'll probably get them wrong, but you get, you find out that it breaks apart into a four domain chain and a two domain chain. The cool thing is all of these domains, so if you look at this, it has a total of 12 domains. Um, am I adding that up right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, 12 domains arranged in four chains. And it is a symmetric structure that looks like a Y. So the way that it's really arranged, they're held together with disulfide bonds in the body. And each of the little boxes is a similar domain. It's called an IG domain, which is just two beta sheets sandwiched on top of each other. And uh, of course, there's differences in the amino acids, but the overall secondary and tertiary structure of these domains is very similar. And you can even see that by looking at the structure of it on the right side of this. You can see that there's um, it forms this Y chain. And the other thing that they noticed is they pretty quickly got down to the sequences of these. The ones, there were eight of the domains that were pretty much the same sequence all the time. Then there were four domains that had different sequences. So the four domains that had different sequences were called variable domains. They got Vs in this. And you see there the four domains on the top of the antibody, the outer end of the Y. These are clearly the places where the antibody changes to be able to bind the antigen. They can be thought of as the business end, like the fork end, uh, you know, the pokey end of the fork, okay? But then there's a part that doesn't change, the constant domains, and you notice that there's one constant domain in each of the light chains, colored in red, but there are four uh, or three constant domains in each of the heavy chains, including the part at the bottom, which is all constant, that is a constant handle that cells, immune cells, can grab onto. So that's the important thing. Variable domains, constant domain, and you can also talk about the different fragments. You see it pretty clearly divides up into four domain fragments, and if you just throw a protease at them, the protease will be pretty, will pretty easily chop it up into three parts, one of which is the handle, so that's called the FC, for the FC region, and then the, you have the other two parts, which are called the FAB, um, you can, fragment of antibody works, but it also works to think of it as ABC. The AB is the main part of the antibody, and the C is kind of the third part of the antibody that is constant. Again, whatever. what's important is that you remember what these are. Um, it's not always clear where the names came from. So that's why we can talk about, when we talk about the variable regions, we're talking about the business end of the antibody that binds antigen. Uh, 
when we talk about the constant regions, it's all the stuff on the bottom, and we usually show it with the variable regions on top. We can also talk about the different chains, and just remember that you have two light chains, two domains each, and two heavy chains, four domains each. And that's, that's how this fundamental understanding of the antibody is really important to pretty much anything that involves the antibodies. That's why the structure is what we start with here. So you can see right away, if antibody has two arms with two FAB uh, fragments potentially in that, you know, four variable domains arranged in pairs, then you have the ability to bind two antigens. Now, the thing is, the antibodies is symmetric, and so it has the same binding site. Natural antibodies have two identical binding sites that are shared between two variable domains each. That means you have buy one, get one binding, because one arm can bind one an oh, antigen, another bar, uh, arm can bind another. And so if the antigen is something that, say, is a repeating protein on the surface of a cell, right away you can get not just one binding site stuck to the cell, but two binding sites. And once one forms, it's easier for the other one to form. Just like once you grab onto something with one hand, it's easier for you to reach over with the other hand. That's the same kind of thing that's going on with antibodies. That is called the avidity effect. It means that when you have an antibody with two binding sites, you end up with really, really tight binding because you have the two binding sites cooperating with each other. So everything that we've talked about is the most common antibody, which is IgG, immunoglobulin G. You run across this all the time in the medical field. IgG has a heavy chain that's called the gamma chain, and it has this Y structure. There are other types of antibodies that show up in different places. We'll just talk about these a little bit, but I'm sure Dr. Pratt in immunology will spend more time talking about the different kinds. We're mostly going to focus on the IgG because those are the nice little blood-borne soluble antibodies. But there's IgA, which is actually a dimer of two different antibodies bound together. Um, the IgM is actually a pentamer, so it has 10 binding sites on one molecule. And IgD and IgE are just different heavy chains that have different constant regions, therefore different handles for the cell to grab onto. So I just want to say if you have allergies or know someone with allergies, someone with, say, a peanut allergy, you ingest something, your immune system freaks out inside your gut. And uh, part of what freaks out, the gut has a different immune system than the rest of the body. It's a very different microbial environment. For example, there are IgE molecules in the blood. If you look over here, they have a picture of an IgE, and you can see, oh, it's a normal-looking Y-shaped antibody, and it just has a um, constant region. And you see the constant region right there is on a mast cell membrane. If you can get into immunology, you can talk about all these different things. There's a whole field of gut immunology. Um, how do we cooperate and live with all the commensal bacteria in our gut? How do we react to food? What causes peanut allergies? there is an IgE at the center of it. And so if you know antibody structure, you immediately know the general structure of an IgE molecule. But mostly we're gonna think about things as far as IgGs, and there's different ways that the IgGs can work. Like we talked about in the last one, they were first found being able to neutralize toxins. If you have diphtheria toxin and you have the antibody around, the diphtheria toxin will go and attack cells, you know, maybe the cells have receptors for it and the toxin like messes with those. Uh, the antibody prevents that from happening because the antibody's two arms are able to form these big aggregates where it binds the toxin so the toxin can't bind the cellular target. Therefore, the toxin does not have an effect. There's other ways that um, antibodies can work. Let's say that the antibody binds to an antigen on bacteria. And so uh, you get a bunch of these blue antibodies on the bacterium itself. And then you have macrophages that go around. One of the ways that macrophages eat bacteria is they have receptors for the constant region of the antibodies. And so they, the antibody binds the bacterium. The macrophage receptor binds the antibody constant region. And then it takes the bacterium in and it, it actually puts it in a chamber and lowers the pH like it floods acid in and the bacterium gets chopped apart. Really nice. 
And then this can also, so antibodies can provoke a cell-based response, like a macrophage response. There's even a set of proteins that are not cell-based at all, called complement, that can actually interact with the antibody FC region. So if you have this complement activation, complement is shown in this sort of teal box in the lower corner. Hopefully you can see that and I'm not blocking it. Here, I'll scroll up so you can see better. Um, for the complement, the complement will actually activate automatically and start to form pores in the cell. You see there's a little teal pore that's being formed. At the same time, you can also have the macrophages come along and they can bind the FC region. So you can have these working together. The cool thing about the complement is it's not cell-based. Uh, so you have all these different possibilities. Macrophage ingestion will depend on antibodies and use the FC region. So that interaction between the macrophage receptor and the antibody FC region is a medically important reaction that we can look at. So the immune system is really complex for all these things to go, but it is built on antibodies. And so you can look through a representation. Here's my favorite biochemical artist, David Goodsell, showing immune recognition of a bacterium. You can see that the bacterium has a flagellum. If you look up in the upper left corner, you can see a flagellum on the green bacterium. And here you have the whole immune system in red and pink and purple that's attacking the bacterium. You in fact see that there's a little pore that's been formed in the bacterium right around here, um, the pink pore in the green bacterium. And then you also even have like an IgM that has the pentameric structure that's binding some kind of surface glycoprotein or protein, um, some, maybe it's a, um, I don't know what kind of protein it is. It's a surface antigen on the green bacterium. And this bacterium is in trouble, which is good because we don't want it to be around. Um, so you can see that there's all sorts of, and if you look over here, you, I can ask you what color does David Goodsell paint antibodies in general? Well, look for the Y shapes and just look carefully at that. And you can see that the color that he chooses for antibodies is pink. Um, so pink antibodies can be seen throughout this in the context of the crowded human body that's going on with this. So how does each B cell generate a unique antibody? Well, it's actually kind of cool, and it's sort of a multi-step process. But the first step is that each B cell will make will have one antibody making gene area. It will be making antibodies from one gene segment. And what it does is it actually will take, uh, it's inherited a bunch of different gene segments. So like here it shows eight different gene segments that it's inherited. And what it will do is it'll actually shuffle these like cards in the deck and it will pick four of these in a particular order. And it's called somatic gene rearrangement. But you take the genes and you deliberately shuffle them. And then you basically have a bunch of B cells that have these expressed B cell receptors, which are in the shape of antibodies on their surface, made up from shuffled gene segments that have been spliced together. Just from a handful of gene segments, here it just shows eight, but if you're picking four and if the order matters, then you have a ton of different possibilities just from combining those eight gene segments together. And they are inherited, so there can be a component of immunity that actually depends on what genes you got from your father and mother. But this is just the first part of things uh, so this is where it starts, but not where it ends. There's incredible binding diversity that's created just from this, a bunch of different B cells with a bunch of different specificities. So the thing is, there's likely to be a B cell that binds weakly, uh, uh, W-E-A-K-L-Y, weakly to an antigen that it's never seen before, just because you have millions of these different clonal B cells. Once they're activated, you make more. So that's great for making weak antibodies. But there's, um, there actually is a system for taking the weak antibody and making it stronger. For example, um, if you look at where, uh, where the antibody is most variable, you can see that there are mutations that go on after an antibody is activated against an antigen. The clones of the B cell start to mutate as well. Once they're activated, they start to mutate to see if they can make better antibodies. And you look at where they mutate. Here's the, vari the variable, the light chain V region. And it's only about 100 residues long, so we can like sequence it and we can see where does it mutate? Where does it get mutations that are different from the original gene that it started with? 
and you can see it gets sort of mutations all over, but there's these three red areas where it gets most of the regions. These are called the hypervariable regions, and they're only like 10 residues long. These are something we can really do stuff with as biochemists. So HV1, 2, and 3. If you paint those um, areas, those hypervariable mutatable areas, look where they show up on the IG domain. The variable IG domain has uh, makes a lot of mutations right in these three loops, and these are the three loops that are on the very tip of the antibody arm. So it looks like the um, once you get an antibody that has a weak binding to antigen, then you make a bunch more of it, and you also mutate the parts that touch the antigen, because you are and the ones that touch the antigen bind more antigen are then amplified. They're selected, and if this sounds a bit like evolution, it is. It is a form of evolution that takes place inside the body. So you can see that these three hypervariable regions, they're also called CDR for complementarity determining region. And if you get into an antibody structure paper, you might see something about the CDR1, 2, and 3. And there's really only three of them. Some people talk about CDR4, by the way. If you look down here, you can see there's a little yellow loop that might have some parts of this. I wonder if we can even see it in the data. It's between CDR2 and CDR3. Maybe you can see a little bump in the data here around 70. Maybe that is CDR4, but it's not as variable as the other ones, and it doesn't contact the antigen as much. So this is called affinity maturation, and it is a form of evolution. So I want to put this idea in your head. In fact, if I'm going to ask you for presentation four to look for uh, an evolution paper a chemistry of evolution paper. And in my view, affinity maturation is close enough to evolution to count. It's a sort of directed evolution. It's cell-based. It's not purely Darwinian, but it is a very cool thing to talk about. So if you find a paper like this, you can use it for presentation four. That's a little ways down the road, but I just want to plant that seed in your head. Okay, because this is about how the uh, antibody affinity maturation is guided by the intrinsic mutability. What is intrinsic mutability and what does it have to do with the process of evolution? I think that's a very interesting idea that you can have something that is intrinsically mutable. What does that mean and can you critique that idea as well? So you have three uh, hypervariable loops, three CDR loops in every V region, and remember that two V domains come together to make a binding site. And so if you have a binding site, you look at it, there's six hypervariable things that can mutate like crazy to improve antibody affinity. The side view of it, they're shown in red here, and you see that they form a whole protein surface. They cover the fingertips of the antibody that are binding the antigen. And so you can give a bunch of different antigens to antibodies, and you'll see that the antibody that ends up forming, those loops, are can be flexible. We're not sure until we find out for sure, but they definitely look like they could move around. And so flexibility might be part of how antibodies recognize antigens. So, for example, if you give a small molecule and generate an antibody against a small antigen, you'll end up with like a little uh, small hole that the molecule fits in, and it forms good bonds to wherever it can on that small molecule. For example, here's a peptide, and this is an HIV peptide that binds an antibody. You can have peptides that bind antibodies, and they make a long groove that complements the shape of the peptide. And then um, you have cases like the lysozyme protein. We showed you the structure of this before. Lysozyme protein will have a broad interface that it interacts with, and each of these atoms is forming a bond or not. And, you know, we'd have to look at it to find out exactly what the structure is. But there's amino acids forming bonds to other amino acids at the surface. So as a protein chemist who wants to understand where amino acids are important and reduce it to chemistry, all of these can be reduced to chemistry. And the protein as an antigen results in a protein-protein um, interaction, which is exactly my field of work. In fact, those of you who are, if you're going to the Erickson conference, find the stuff from my lab. We're working on protein chemistry to be able to look at a specific antibody-antigen interaction.
So if you have like a small molecule like phosphorylcholine, and if you look over here, you can see the phosphate group in pink. You can see the choline group, which is a um, positively charged group. Oh, did I say that backwards? Phosphorylcholine? Yeah, that's the phosphate group. Because I can say I know that's the phosphate group because number one is tetrahedral. It's a different color, so that's an indication that it's phosphate. And also it's binding to an arginine. So that means you have a plus charge that's interacting with the minus charge of the phosphate group. And so you have this arginine on the heavy chain, position 52, that's forming good bonds to the phosphate group. That's how the antibody recognizes antigen. So you, this is why you need to know your amino acids, because you need to look at this and say, oh, that makes sense. Arginine binds phosphate. If you look over here at the other end, you have the choline group, but that's covered up by a bunch of methyl, methyl groups. And so the methyl groups appear to bond their hydrophobic residues, where you have a tryptophan and you have a tyrosine. But if you know about choline, it's uh, a nitrogen with a positive charge on it. So you should be looking around for a negative charge in the antibody that will help bind the positive charge in the antigen. Do you see it? There it is. Aspartate L97. And so all of these residues make a binding site that binds the antibody, and you can come up with reasons for how does that binding work. So the antibodies can be flexible. Here's the evidence for uh, a case where the loops are flexible. Remember, we aren't ever sure that loops are flexible until we actually test them and find out. This is an antibody without antigen with the antigen, and then you in pymol you turn off the antigen so you don't see it anymore, but with the antigen bound, you can see that the antibody has a very different configuration. Without antigen, antigen binds and the loops reorganize to make that antigen shape. It looks like it's about a peptide shape and size that will bind in there. Oh, and there it is. It is a peptide. Good thing. I didn't remember that, but i um, glad I was right. So that means that all the kinds of bonds we talked about are important now as chemical links between antibody and antigen. And we can see that there's a bunch of them, but we don't know which ones are important until we do the test. And we can say that this one looks important, and we can have a hypothesis, but we really need to do the test where we can mutate it and we can see if it's important or not. Mutate it, measure binding, see if it's important. And so, for example, this is a nice uh, little picture of what hydrogen bonds are literally bonding the antibody to, on the bottom, the yellow and orange antibody, to the blue antigen. And you can imagine them as little springs that are sort of holding things together when, they are, um, when they're in the right orientation. So charge-charge interactions, hydrophobic interactions we showed you, hydrogen bonds we've showed you, basically any kind of interaction that we've seen holding proteins together is what we're going to see for antibodies when the antigen is a protein itself. Actually, even when the antigen is anything else, the antibody side is going to always be made of amino acids. So this is a really cool um, chemistry type thing. Now, you make a lot of antibodies at once. Usually you have a couple of different B cell clones that are turned on. So you have a miniature clone army where you have like six different uh, clones and maybe you have different points of affinity maturation. The main thing is the body makes every antibody it can. And so the body makes a bunch of different antibodies. They're called polyclonal. If you just take the antibodies like they did for the animal with the diphtheria ox, uh, toxin test, where they took the antibodies out of one a uh, animal, those were polyclonal. They were a mix of different sequences. But we want to use them as chemicals. And so what, what we want to do is we want to isolate one good antibody. All the things I just showed you of structures were of one antibody bound to one antigen. So to study it as chemists, we want to simplify it from polyclonal to monoclonal. Okay, so you can purify out one B cell. Um, you know, you basically take out one B cell and you make it pro proliferate. And then you have all one, one culture of one clone of a B cell, and that's a defined protein, and that's what you can do protein chemistry on. So when you have, let's say that you want to use the antibody as a therapeutic, usually the best way to do it is to have your therapeutic be chemically well-defined. You know exactly what you're making. And so that's why monoclonals are used for therapies. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, you've probably heard of them being used against COVID. Um, that's just the, the fruit of a whole biotech industry that's been making them against all sorts of diseases. And the disease that they've had a lot of success for is 
antibodies against cancer proteins. These are cancer therapies. And when you have uh, an antibody, you want to give it a name and they always give it a name with MAB at the end. So if you have a drug that has MAB at the end, it is a monoclonal antibody. There's actually a whole number of uh, conventions that you can actually tell what the target system is for the antibody and what the source system is for the antibody, uh, be, depending on the vowels and the consonants in the uh, name itself. So rituximab, you can actually sort of decode it you can look at the Z, um, so XI means that rituximab is a chimeric source subsystem. That means that we've taken gene sequences from different species and we've put them, usually what you do is you take the CDRs from one species because those really determine how tight the binding is. And you put the sequence for the CDRs in a human antibody so the, the human immune system doesn't freak out at this antibody. It sees a human antibody, it says, okay, you're good. That's what a chimeric one is. I didn't mean to go into that level of detail, but that's what you can do. Uh, and then if you go back a little bit more, it's rituximab, and it looks like it's a tumor. So it looks like it's against a, uh, the target is a tumor antigen. And right over here on the, on the right, you can see the target is CD20. So if you know a, a MAB, you can decode what the MAB is from its name. I think that's really cool because they always look random to me. And the first part is kind of random, but the middle parts actually have a convention if they follow it. So of course, with, with, of course, with SARS-CoV-2, we've come up with some MABs that will bind the viral spike protein. This is the most prominent protein. There's a bunch of other proteins in the virus and that the virus makes when it infects, but those are mostly inside the cell. The one that's sticking out, the one that's the easiest for the immune system to recognize when the virus is just floating around out there, is the spike protein. So here's a nice little cartoon that emphasizes the spike the way it should be emphasized. And so in early 2020, we already had an antibody that binds SARS-CoV's spike protein. Remember that SARS-CoV-2 is related to the original SARS, which was the epidemic in Asia in 2003-2004. And so that's been studied by scientists. And when its cousin, SARS-CoV-2, started to infect, we already had a bunch of things that worked against SARS-CoV. And I want you to show you at the top here. This is a section of the spike protein for SARS-CoV on the top compared to CoV-2 on the bottom. And you see that they're, they're actually, if you look up and down, they're pretty darn similar. In fact, the two are about 90% identical. If you look up and down, it's hard to find a difference if you uh, I believe they're highlighted yeah all the differences are highlighted um, blue is differences that are similar residues like you have a lysine and an arginine red is uh, differences that are rather different and so you can see that um, most of the residues are exactly the same and if the antibody doesn't care about every single residue it's possible that we already had antibodies that didn't care about the mutated residues. Um, so we could take a SARS-1 antibody and it would work against SARS-2. And that's exactly what we have right here. This is a, this is a, um, they actually took a sequence alignment. This is not an actual structure. This is more of a model, but they took uh, the antibody and they said, oh, we know from lab tests that this antibody binds. This is the structure of how we think it binds because we know the structure of SARS-CoV and we just uh, assume that SARS-CoV-2 is similar enough that the overall structure is the same. It's exactly like what you did with ITASR, homology modeling 4361, okay? So you have this whole, um, this whole arrangement, blue with similar residues and red with different residues. Uh, and there's enough residues that are the same uh, that the antibodies can't, some antibodies can actually work. How do we find what those antibodies are? How do we um, know how they work so maybe we can combine them? That's all protein chemistry questions. So actually, if you look at the, and this antibody is against the receptor binding domain, you see this gray domain is just a bit of the overall spike protein, but you have the red antibody that is binding the receptor binding domain. That's really what we want to go after because ideally an antibody will bind to the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 on the spike before that receptor binding domain binds its receptor. The antibody can literally block 
the interaction and prevent the virus from ever getting into the cell. That is a great way to prevent disease. And so if you look at this, you have, um, you have the antibody modeled onto the receptor binding domain. Uh, the purple spheres are the ones that are really different in SARS-CoV-2. And you can see there aren't many purple spheres where the antibody is contacting the antigen here. So they said from this, we think that this is an accurate model of how this antibody binds antigen. And so we've already got, you know, this the disease was just located a couple months ago. But because we have a SARS-CoV-1 antibody that works, we already even have a pretty good idea of what its structure looks like. Here's all the details about it, and this is um, how it looked a year ago when we were talking about monoclonal antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, you can look at this if you're interested in more of the details. The one thing I want to point out is they're talking about mutations that are different between CoV-1 and CoV-2. And uh, here you have the mutations are literally amino acids. So that's why it's helpful to know V483A, valine to alanine. Oh, that's a biochemical change. I know what that is. And here is the, uh, the data where they showed SARS-CoV, or they showed their antibody, their SARS-CoV antibody working against SARS-CoV. Okay, big surprise on the left. But on the right, they show it working against SARS-CoV-2. And so they showed that it works maybe not quite as well, but pretty well. You know, that this is definitely a, potentially a therapy. So this is how we got antibodies and structures before we had the chance to um, really even get the real crystal structures. Of course, then a huge effort got a bunch of crystal structures, and we're going to have a section about SARS-CoV-2 structures that's coming up soon. The one thing that you see, my friend posted this. She's not in science, and so um, she saw this, and, and it's like the four-year-old llama named Winter could hold the key to a cure. This was, again, about a year ago. Uh, and so she was like, llama? Why, why in the world? Well, the reason why a llama is, uh, is helpful for, for a cure to COVID is because llama antibodies are simpler than other mammals' antibodies. And you can use the llamas to make antibodies against whatever you want. And so llamas are camelids. And the cool thing about uh, llama antibodies is they are so small, they're easily easy to simpl simplify into a single domain. You don't have to worry about multiple domains, multiple chains coming together like you do for regular antibodies. And so they're just great reagents. You know, as a protein chemist, it's um, they're also very sturdy. They just work well. The llama's immune system is just slightly different. They prioritized stability of the antibody, and um, they prioritized having a small one. So we can use that to make small antibodies. So right down here, you have the antibody in the llama antibody in blue, and you have the uh, SARS-CoV-1 receptor binding domain in red. Again, this is a SARS-CoV-1, but most of those will work for SARS-CoV-2 as well. And so they got a crystal structure of the SARS, um, the SARS antibody bound to SARS-CoV-1 receptor binding domain. And I just want to say, look at those interactions. Hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions. You can see that there's loops that are involved in binding. It's the same principles that we talked about. It's just a smaller package. Uh, that's easier to work with experimentally. And then the other thing that they do is they actually um, through, they actually measured the binding using this technology called BIACOR surface plasmon resonance. Now, I get into exactly how this works in my physical chemistry class, so I'm not going to involve it in this biochemistry class. The one thing it will be is that you put the antibody and antigen together and you literally measure how much of the proteins are binding. And from that, the higher you get, the higher the signal, the more binding you're seeing. You also get, so you can get a KD, a dissociation constant, and you see right here, this is a 38 nanomolar dissociation constant. That's pretty tight if you remember that section of biochemistry. We also have kinetics. We talked about enzyme kinetics in biochemistry. This is binding kinetics, which is actually slightly simpler. Same type of thing. 
and you get the kinetics for what is the speed of binding and speed of dissociation. And this is what we have. This is actually a pretty fast dissociating antibody, um, but it does bind really fast and it ends up being fast on, fast off. So what they did is they took the structure and they colored um, all the, the residues pink and all the places that were different between SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, they colored green. And you can see that the antibody touches a lot of pink, but not a lot of green. That is an indication that this antibody will bind SARS-CoV-2 well, and that we have an explanation, a structural explanation for how it works, uh, that the structural model is adequate. So now there's a couple of more recent papers, and that will end this part when I talk about these. Uh, so SARS-CoV-2, we've gotten a bunch of different structures, and these are actually, this is from Pamela Bjorkman's lab. She was a mentor to my postdoc advisor, Roland Strong. And uh, um, so she's a prominent name in structural immunology. And what she did is they've looked at enough antibody antigen structures that they're starting to say, hey, we're seeing four different classes here. And that might help us as we're trying to figure out how to use these antibodies as therapeutics. That's how many structures we have. This particular paper has like eight different structures. They both have the antibodies by themselves and occasionally bound to the receptor binding domain. They can do models, they can put them in their computers, they can look at the structures and they can say, okay, which atoms are next to which other atoms? And we can draw, make chemical hypotheses for how immunology works. So for example, what she did is um, Pamela Bjorkman and the others, um, they, uh, the team looked at how these antibodies would bind to the receptor binding domain. And so right here you have the antibodies that are shown, like here's um, C102 antibody, and they imagined what if a C102 antibody bound at the same time as C105. Now because there are, the spike uh, is a trimer, therefore you have three different RBDs on the spike, and they're showing one of them in red right here. But the RBDs can be up or down, the spike is very flexible. And so here you have different antibodies, and the question they're asking, can two of these antibodies bind at the same time to the same spike. Well, for this one, they actually said, okay, if the RBD is up, they can coexist. But if the RBD has flexed down, then this type of antibody will run into the other antibody and you'll have a clash. Basically, the confirmation matters for this kind of antibody. So they said this is the kind of class of antibody where it cares whether the RBD is flipped up or flipped down, because otherwise you get this big old clash. So overall, they looked at these are class one, and by the way, they defined this one as class one, they block ACE2 binding, which is the receptor that the virus binds to in cells. So they will block the binding of receptor, and they only bind to up RBDs. They don't bind to down RBDs that changes how they work. Notice that class one is shown in green on this figure and they're showing class two has a different binding site on the RBD, the gray RBD in the middle. Class two can actually recognize both up and down. When it flips down, the binding site is still available. And so that's a different class of antibodies and it probably will work differently in the cell. Class three is antibodies that bind outside the, the binding site and then class four was a miscellaneous. So you kind of have up RBD binding, up and down RBD binding, and then um, outside the binding site as well. They don't block ACE2, which means that they might behave differently in the clinic, but they might still have some use. Ideally, we want, we want to start with class one and class two. And so I just wanna say these different behaviors of antibodies correspond to different structures, and you can define them structurally as these classes. So that is um, what CoV-2 has to do with monoclonal antibodies, and it's why structural immunology is so important. We have one more uh, part that we're going to go through. We're going to take a little bit of a detour because biochemists know we've been talking about James Wells. So what does James Wells has to do with antibodies? We will answer that in part three.